So your lines will be muted throughout the presentation, um, but we do have time for two question and answer sessions, one at the middle and one at the end. Um, we ask that you submit your questions as you have them through the chat box. That's in your control panel, that little gray box on the right-hand side of your screen. Just type your question in and send it our way as you have them, and we'll read those out during one of the two question and answer sessions. Uh, just to get in front of this, these slides and a recording of the webinar will be available on insurekidsnow.gov uh, about a couple of weeks after the conclusion of the webinar, and we can always send it to you independently if you need it before then. That really covers it in terms of housekeeping, so I'm going to turn it over to Donna Cohen-Ross, Director of Enrollment Initiatives at CMCS, to kick us off. Great. Thank you so much, Riley, and thank you everyone for joining this afternoon. Um, I think we have determined that we have a record number of, uh, of people signing, uh, signing up for today. Over 800 people uh, have, have said that they're going to be joining us this afternoon. And what this means to us is that this is a critically important topic. From our perspective, it's one that we haven't done as much as we should about. And so this is our effort to change that. Um, but it also tells us that uh, folks around the country who are helping families and individuals enroll in the Medicaid and CHIP programs want and need this information. So we are very delighted to be um, hosting this webinar this afternoon. We have some experts with us today. We have some folks who are going to talk about um, uh, helping people understand their coverage and getting the health care that they need in a very broad sense. Um, we have uh, some focus on Medicaid, which we know is really important to everybody on the phone, important to us as well. And we also have uh, some folks from communities uh, throughout the country who are going to talk about how they're making this work in a very uh, focused way in their own communities. So we really feel like we are covering the gamut and we're going to be very interested in uh, hearing what, what there is to learn and also to your wonderful questions during our question and answer periods. Um, I am going to um, introduce our speakers um, as we uh, have them ready to speak so that you'll, you'll meet them as they're ready. Um, but first, I want to uh, just say a couple of things. One, I have to believe that most, if not all of you, have already been alerted to this, but if not, I wanted to share that uh, about a week ago, um, CMS put out uh, the new solicitation for Navigator Grants. We, in one of our e-newsletters, again about a week ago, we shared that announcement with our grantees and partners, um, along with a link. Um, if you do not receive our e-newsletter, we will have instructions for you at the end of the webinar on how to sign up. You get all kinds of great information, like where the Navigator Grants are and what they're about, but if you didn't get this, um, there is uh, information about the grants on cms.gov, and we will send that out, uh, that link, which is rather long to read, but we'll send that link out to everybody so that you'll have um, information about that. Um, I'm also pleased to share, which again, I think probably many, if not most of you already know, um, we are very pleased that the CHIP program has been reauthorized. Uh, uh, for two years, and within that authorization, besides making sure that the program remains up and running, we also will be able to have another round of Connecting Kids to Coverage Outreach grants. Um, just keep your eyes peeled for more information on that. We will um, uh, have more information as it becomes available, but I know I've been getting lots of phone calls about that and wanted to share that news with all of you. Um, I want to not take any more time and get into the meat of our conversation today, but just start by saying that since uh, October 2013, when we really began um, in earnest with um, open enrollment in the marketplace and really pushing for uh, everyone to have health coverage, we have uh, seen the enrollment numbers for Medicaid increase. We have 11.2 uh, million additional people in the Medicaid program. Um, that's by our last report. Um, I think actually the numbers are now higher than that. But the point 
here is that we have lots of people enrolled in the program, many, many for the first time, and knowing what to do once you have that coverage, knowing how to take that, um, that coverage and get access to the health care you need is a whole new set of skills for a lot of people. And so many of you who are working hard to help people get enrolled are also um, being now uh, asked a lot of questions about what to do now that somebody has their Medicaid card um, and how do they understand what's available to them and how they should proceed. Uh, and so what we wanted to do today was address some of those issues um, and I know we'll be hearing lots more about what more you need, but we wanted to start today with uh, just some of those broad concepts and also uh, a focus on benefits that are available to people who now have coverage under Medicaid and CHIP, children in particular. So with that, I want to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Jane Perkins, who's the Legal Director at MHealth, the National Health Law Program. Uh, a longtime friend and colleague uh, to me personally, but also to the Medicaid program as a whole. Um, and we've asked Jane to join us today from North Carolina to talk about what is so specific and important about the uh, Medicaid benefit for children. What do children get once they're enrolled in Medicaid? And how do we help make sure that families know how to take full advantage of that important benefit. So Jane, welcome today, and um, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you very much, Donna, and I, I'm very thrilled to be uh, here today. This uh, number of people who have, who have signed up for this is sort of daunting, uh, but it's also very exciting. It's clear that a lot of effort has gone into helping families enroll in health coverage, and Donna's statistics just given show that these enrollment efforts are, have been very successful. This webinar today, as she mentioned, is a bit different. Uh, now that children are under the coverage tent, how can we help children and adolescents and their families make their coverage real and help them get, get the benefits that they should be getting? And I think that the thing that, that comes out to me from this enrollment uh, number, as Donna was saying, it the thing that popped into my mind was these three words, no missed opportunities. The people on this call do not want to miss the opportunity for doing what they can do to hook families up to coverage that can help their kids. Researchers have investigated what makes people use their health coverage, and in particular, what makes limited income families and children get preventive care. And one finding from this work is actually common sense, but it is a finding from this work, and that is that families will use coverage for their children if they understand some of the benefits of preventive care, how their coverage is designed to reap those benefits, and how to use their coverage. As Donna mentioned, there is, in fact, a specific benefit, a benefit specifically designed to meet the needs of low-income children and adolescents, and you and we all have a vital role to play in helping families understand the benefits of that coverage, what it is, and how to use it. I'm going to provide an overview so that, there we will, that we will minimize missed opportunities to connect families. So the first step is to talk with families about why coverage is important. As you see from this slide, um, childhood and adolescence are a time of, of rapid brain and body development. Children aren't little adults, and you parents on this call who have adolescents may be disagreeing with this next line, but adolescents aren't big children. They have uh, developmental needs um, and uh, physical needs that are different from those of adults. Poor children have needs that are different from higher income children. They experience health disparities. And here's some, a list of some of the typical disparities that they, uh, that they experience. They're more likely to have vision, hearing, and speech problems. 80% of learning comes through a visual pathway. I'm not talking anymore. 
solely about sitting in the classroom and looking at the blackboard. I'm talking about looking at this computer screen that you're looking at today, looking at your smartphones, as I'm sure some of you are doing, um, and tracking left to right, um, and not just distance visual acuity. 80% um, of learning through a visual pathway. Untreated tooth decay. Uh, over 36% of poor young children have at least one untreated decayed tooth, compared to about 17% of non-poor children. Minority children are more likely to have dental decay than white children, and their decay is more severe. 40% of Mexican-American children, 29% of African-American children have had caries when compared to 18% of white children. Elevated lead blood levels. Just because we don't have lead in most paint anymore doesn't mean we don't still have lead problems. We do. And we know that over the past 50 years, research has shown that even very low levels of lead in a child's blood can lead to um, neurological damage, decreased IQ, anemia, uh, detrimental impact on the IQ, a, li a greater likelihood of having a learning disability, of having problems achieving educational attainment, and reading readiness at the kindergarten level. Low-income children are more likely to have elevated lead blood levels, and children of color are more likely to have ele elevated lead blood levels. Low-income children are more likely to suffer from asthma, to experience behavioral health problems, and to have transportation problems getting to health care coverage. So we have this benefit for children. It's called EPSDT. What does that stand for? Early and periodic screening, diagnostic, and treatment. Now, I've been doing this work for over 30 years, and I've heard these initials really um, abused. And it's difficult to keep them in the correct order. We used to say every president should destroy tapes. That is now passe. We have now come up with an updated um, mnemonic to remember the order of these letters. I will give it to you now. It's coming right out of the news. Every president should destroy text. So early and periodic screening, diagnostic, and treatment. So next slide. When a family comes in to you and you're talking about EPSDT, um, make sure in your state to look and see. It may be called something more sensical and easier to get out of your mouth, like healthy families um, or children's prevention services. Some such name as that. It's important to let people know that this service, whatever it may be called in your state, EPSDT makes a difference. And what makes it different? CMS has put it really well. The EPSDT benefit is more robust than the Medicaid benefit for adults and is designed to ensure to assure that children receive early detection and care so that health problems are averted or diagnosed and treat it as early as possible. The goal of EPSDT is to assure that individual children get the health care they need when they need it, the right care to the right child at the right time in the right setting. If we can all play our role in providing information to families about why preventive care is important, this benefit is there to meet their specific needs. So they may have some questions. One question a family might ask is, who gets EPSDT? It's a mandatory Medicaid service for children and youth under the age of 21. It covers more than one in four children in the United States. It covers 30% of all pediatric visits. Remember that after the Affordable Care Act was passed, children qualify for Medicaid up to age 19 if their incomes are below 138% of the poverty level. Many states have implemented CHIP through a Medicaid expansion or parts of their CHIP program through a Medicaid expansion, they get EPSDT too. And the word, lawyers say it's an entitlement. That means you have a legal right to it, just like you have a right to a public education. Next slide. The next question would be, well, what 
EPSDT, early and periodic screen, should my child get? The federal law requires them to get four separate screens. And you can see how these are really tied to the preventive care that low-income children are likely to need. Um, medical screening, including health and developmental assessments, an unclothed physical exam, immunizations, lab tests, specifically including lead blood tests, and that is a te test at 12 and 24 months of age, and health education and anticipatory guidance to both the child and their family or caregiver. Hearing, screening, and including hearing aids, vision assessment, including eyeglasses, and dental assessment and screening, and that includes relief of pain, restoration of teeth, and maintenance of dental health. When should my child get one of these screens? The law provides that these should be provided on a periodic basis, and these are set according to their age. Those of you with kids it's, would, would call this a well-child visit. Um, these are scheduled at, at periodic intervals over the child or adolescent's lifetime. They tend to become to be more frequent in the earlier years of life and then be uh, annual as the child ages. In addition, if a problem is detected between uh, a periodic screen, say between there's a periodic screen at age 14 and a periodic screen at age 15, but a problem is detected by a health care provider, by a school teacher, by a parent, then uh, what's called an interperiodic or an as-needed screening is also covered. So this is designed to make sure that families can, can, and children and youth can get into what they need at any time they need to get into it. So here's a case example from a case that we had in our office. JC was a 12-year-old girl who was enrolled in Medicaid. She had always done well in school, academically and socially. However, this academic year, she complained about her schoolwork. She didn't turn in her homework. Her teachers repeatedly were calling her mother to say she wasn't paying attention in class. Many kids like this, and there's research uh, on this, are, are um, found to have a developmental problem or a behavioral health problem. It turned out that JC had a vision problem, and that once that problem was, was detected and corrected, as many, many vision problems can be, she became the old JC that her family and teachers were used to uh, seeing each day. So I've talked about, I'm, let me just say as well, I'm moving through this to give a broad overview because I think these are the broad questions that parents might ask, that families might ask. And um, there's lots of more detailed information, and I'm going to give you some um, suggestions for where you and families can get that information uh, at the end of my presentation. Once a, a, a child goes through a screen or if a problem is detected and the, and the child needs treatment, then the next question that a family would ask, a parent or an adolescent uh, would ask was, well, what does this benefit cover? It is a, a gold standard benefit for low-income children. It really is designed to um, cover the comprehensively the treatment needs that low-income children have. The law requires states to arrange directly or through referral for corrective treatment needed as a result of a screen. There's a federal scope of benefit and a federal definition of medical necessity. Here is a listing of some of the federal benefits, or in other words, some of the benefits that, that children and youth are entitled to under EPSDT when they need them. Um, physician services, lab services, outpatient and inpatient hospital, home health care. There, in the Medicaid Act, there are a number of optional services for adults, and the blue list is a list of services that states do not have to but can cover for adults. The, the difference with EPSDT is that they must cover these services when a child needs them. Um, 
even if they don't cover them under the state Medicaid plan for adults, personal care services, dental services, physical therapy services, home health care. That also includes medical equipment, transportation, and related services. That's important to a child because one of the related services under transportation is uh, lodging assistance for uh, the parent or caregiver if an overnight stay is required for the child. If a state has a 12 uh, physical therapy limit for adults, that limit cannot apply for children if the child, if, if, the, if the physical therapy service is necessary for the child. And that then gets to the federal definition of medical necessity. The federal law entitles children to treatment and services necessary to correct or ameliorate physical and mental illnesses and conditions. Ameliorate means to improve or maintain health, to compensate for a health problem, to prevent it from worsening, to prevent the development of additional problems. You get the idea. This is not a benefit that is dependent upon continuing to progress or a benefit that will go away if the child plateaus and is not going to um, continue to clinically improve against clinical improvement markers. If the service is needed to ameliorate their condition, they're entitled to it. So federal def scope of benefits, federal definition of medical necessity. Here's how a case came into our office. DE was a 12-year-old boy who suffered from pervasive developmental delay, uh, PTSD, ADHD, autism, he had significant speech and language delays. He lived with his grandmother when he was not cycling in and out of hospital and other res residential placements. When he came to us, he was living at home. The only service that he really received with any regularity was medication management. And that really set him up for a cycle, for this cycle that he was going through of going in and out of the hospital. He needed a range of behavioral health care and case management services. And when you broke apart what he needed, those services fit within various Medicaid boxes that were listed in that previous slide. And he could be uh, provided with a comprehensive set of benefits at home with his grandmother and not be going in and out of, of hospital placements, which, by the way, his hospital treatment team said were actually harmful for him we're actually harming him. So I think that a question that comes up for, for us when we're saying we don't want to miss opportunities is how can I, as someone assisting families, find out about EPSDT? But families are also going to say, how can I find out about EPSDT? We all have an important role to play. States have an important role. As a result, they are likely to have developed resources that you can use that families should have access to uh, as well. Uh, states are to, uh, uh, the, there's a federal guideline that says that prior to the due date of each medical screen, states should offer transportation and appointment scheduling assistance to the family to make sure they get to that screen. They need to be informing families and children about EPSDT and the benefits of preventive care using outreach that is oral and written and accessible and involving MCOs, WIC, Head Start, schools, healthcare providers, legal aid, disability rights, it places where that are coming into contact with families and children. And people who are providing navigator assistance to families are certainly among that core group. So there is um, the, there are communications to be had between state EPSDT coordinators and navigators to make sure that information is flowing about the benefits of preventive care, EPSDT, what it is, and where to get it so that families and children are getting the services that they need. Now, here are just some listing of resources. CMS has put some strategy guides together. These are actually for states. But when you look at them, you'll see that they are chock full of information that is not focusing on the push 
of regulation, but rather the pull of best practices, pulling, pulling programs along to get them into a really good place for kids. And there's, there are examples there of how these aspects of EPSDT are working that we all, in looking to avoid missed opportunities, can use and learn from. So I highly commend these uh, four strategy guides to you. Uh, they concern coverage, oral health, adolescent health, and uh, care coordination. Jane, thank you so much for that walkthrough. I have to say, I am glad that we did not miss the opportunity to have you <laughs> talk with us today about EPSCT because I think um, the full breadth of what this benefit offers is not as well known to people as we would like it to be. And so this is a hugely important way to get people started. So thank you. And stick with us, because we're going to get to a question and answer period in a little while. But before we do, I want to welcome our next speaker, Jessica Burkhardt, who is the project manager uh, for community health improvement at the Northwest Regional Primary Care Association. Jessica is going to talk to us about what community health centers in her area are doing to help people understand their benefits and get access to care. So welcome, Je Jessica. We're really happy to have you today. Great. Thanks for inviting me, guys. And I guess it's officially good afternoon to everybody, except for maybe some Alaskans and Hawaiians. Um, as mentioned, my name is Jessica Burkhardt, and I work with the Northwest Regional Primary Care Association. Uh, just a little bit about us. We are a regional membership association representing community health centers in what's known as Region X or Region 10. So that includes Washington, Idaho, Alaska, and Oregon. And we provide a, an array of different services from workforce development, community health improvement program, and other member services. So I wanted to chat a little bit about this concept of health literacy. And I was so excited that I was invited to um, present on this, because this has been a topic that's been of significant interest of mine, and community health centers have really played um, a critical role in the outreach and enrollment landscape. So for those of you who don't know what a community health center is, um, they are funded by HRSA, and they tend to be a private or nonprofit entity, entity that's community-based and patient-directed organ organizations that are governed by a community board. Now, their main goal is to provide primary and preventive care to the medically underserved and uninsured. And that happens to typically be Medicaid-eligible um, populations. However, they also serve HRSA-specified special populations that include the homeless, uh, individuals that live in public housing, um, farm workers, but you'll also see other vulnerable populations that they serve, such as low-income, refugees, and so forth. Next slide. So I know that most of you guys on this call, um, I'm probably preaching to the choir a bit on Medicaid outreach, but I think it's really important um, to touch on how they conduct their Medicaid outreach because it aligns with how they do their health um, insurance education. So you'll see a, a lot of efforts where they're utilizing data, community members, and org organizations, um, developing partnerships, of course, the traditional marking methodologies, and a lot of emphasis on grassroots and groundwork, especially with Medicaid populations. So I'm going to highlight two uh, community health centers in our region. The first is called Health Point, and they're located in SeaTac, Washington. And for those of you that are not familiar with Washington State, uh, the SeaTac community, I'm, I'm pretty sure, is uh, the most diverse or one of the most diverse uh, cities in the nation. There's something like 75 to 80 languages that are spoken, um, a very eclectic community, and a majority of the population are Medicaid eligible. And so HealthPoint utilized a lot of the methodologies that I just mentioned to target and enroll their Medicaid population. So they partnered with um, a local organization called Global to Local, who was really uh, critical in their outreach and also in their health literacy efforts. They conducted over 60 different events. They did marketing. They did um, groundwork, made sure that they were utilizing community members to really engage their community to step, set the stage for enrollment and then the next steps. The second uh, organization 
a community health center located in Portland, Oregon, called Central City Concern, also utilized some of the methodologies I mentioned. They took uh, kind of a step back by educating their staff uh, pretty intensively on the population itself. I think developing relationships with Medicaid, uh, Medicaid populations is really important. Uh, there tends to be certain characteristics in the population that can make it challenging to work with and to do outreach and engagement. So they did a really great job uh, utilizing grassroots efforts, developing fact sheets, training their staff, partnering with local organizations to reach those populations. Next slide. So they're enrolled now what? And I think for a lot of us that have, that have been involved in the outreach and enrollment program, you know, initially there was a lot of emphasis on, you know, getting folks enrolled. That's the end of the line. But I think we're now really realizing, wait a minute, that's really kind of the starting line to, you know, the, the, the whole aspect of, of having coverage and obtaining care and using your health coverage. Um, I want to say just kind of a quick story. I, I have a friend who got a full ride scholarship to a, one of the best uh, universities in the nation and we were chatting on Skype one night and she was waving her insurance card in front of me saying I got insurance and plain doubles advocate I asked her you know so you know what are you going to do uh, when you need care and she looked me straight in the face and said I'm going to go to the emergency room and it really kind of shocked me because I thought you know she's very well educated she, she comes from a background that had access to care and I think it really illustrates that you can be from any you know, socio-demographic or class or population, and it really doesn't matter um, where you come from or who you are, that health insurance literacy and health literacy in general um, will affect you. So looking past coverage, what are the next steps? And I think first and foremost is insurance education, so helping consumers understand their benefits and make the most out of their plan. Next is health literacy education, so helping consumers understand that the health system, how to navigate it, and not just navigate it, but navigate it efficiently and effectively. Engagement, you know, ensuring that consumers are uh, learning how to identify a primary care provider and or clinic where they should go to, because again, you know, a lot of folks wait until they have an emergency or they're sick and then they're in the ER, and we're really trying to focus on that preventive and primary care. And that's, again, that activation piece that you see as number four. So I just wanted to kind of highlight, you know, what happens after you get somebody enrolled. And I think it's a perfect segue into what some of our community health centers have done uh, to address this issue. Next slide. So I also want to take a moment to differentiate between health literacy and health insurance literacy, because they're really two uh, different concepts, and you really can't have one without the other. So first, I think a lot of people are talking about health literacy, and I think it's important to note that, it, again, it, it differs from health insurance literacy. So health literacy is defined, and this comes from HRSA, as the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand basic health information needed to make appropriate health decisions and services needed to prevent or treat illness. So this definition, if you read it, kind of has an assumption that the person knows their insurance and what's covered and what's not, and that they, they already have the, the, that competency to, to dive into the health system. But really, we have to take a step back, kind of up the ladder, and think about health insurance literacy, because that's really going to be critical um, in setting the stage for someone to gain health literacy. So looking at the definition provided by Enroll America, uh, health insurance literacy is defined as it measures the degree to which individuals have the knowledge, ability, and confidence to find and evaluate information about health plans, select the best plan for their financial and health circumstances, and use the plan once enrolled. So I think a lot of times we lump health literacy into health insurance literacy and vice versa, and I think it's really important to note that these are two separate concepts, and I'm going to be showing what community health centers have done to address health insurance literacy. Next slide. So why is health literacy important? Besides the fact that it is the next step, right, towards engagement and utilization, I think there's other implications that I really want to note that really shows how, um, it illustrates how health insurance literacy and health literacy affects our healthcare system. You know, there's a lot of operational and workforce implications. You know, you've got an individual who um, 
you know, doesn't understand uh, the components of their care or their discharge, and they're coming back in. It could be readmissions. It could be um, your staff, you know, having to spend extra time to help explain how to use their coverage or how to navigate the system. And there's also a lot of cost implications. Individuals with low health literacy average almost $13,000 annually in health care costs versus $3,000 for those who have high health literacy. And these, um, these low health literacy uh, trends have almost $250 billion impact on our, on our U.S. economy. And if you think about it, it represents almost 15 to 20 percent of all personal health care expenditures. I mean, this is a costly um, component that we really need to address in our health systems. And of course, you know, our overarching goal is to pr improve the health and wellness outcomes of underserved populations and, and I think populations in general. And who are the most effect, um, affected? I think it's kind of um, obvious that, you know, seniors tend to fall into this, uh, Hispanic and Latinos, people with chronic conditions, uh, but there's also an array of other populations that this affects. Refugees, rural frontier communities, recent immigrants, um, folks who, who didn't graduate high school, uh, Native Alaskan tribes, those living below the federal poverty line, and you know, all these groups incorporate families and children, and so I think we oftentimes think think automatically, you know, farm workers or people with chronic conditions, the elderly, but really, it, as I illustrated with my story earlier, it affects everybody and anyone. So I think it's important to note that when you look at someone or, um, in your care, in your clinic or your hospital setting, that you don't assume based on their appearance or their class or their socioeconomics that um, they got it down but, or they might actually have challenges. So keep an open mind when you're thinking about uh, the groups that you're working with. Next slide. I think it's also important that patients want to understand. I, I wish I put a polling in question here to ask how many folks on the line have ever Googled, um, you know, health information or condition or, you know, headaches. And I think it's safe to say that all of us have done it. You know, 75% of adults have looked for health, health or medical information with 60% using, uh, utilizing the Internet to obtain that information. And health information still remains um, in the top three most popular online activities. So that's above any trending topics, cultural events, uh, pop culture, that health information still remains one of the top searched items. So people really want to understand. And if you give them the information, they'll utilize it. Next slide. Also, this I thought was really interesting, um, came from the Health Reform Monitoring Survey, Urban Institute for uh, Health Policy Center. And this was, um, a survey they did that they evaluated um, adult Medicaid population and they also uh, surveyed another group to kind of compare and contrast whether or not they felt very or somewhat confident in understanding terms. And again, I think this illustrates that it doesn't matter what your background is, where you come from, that everybody has challenges understanding uh, terms related to access to care and benefits, um, either even outside of Medicaid, you know, premium, deductibles, all these uh, terms that we're familiar with because we've worked in this industry, but I think it's safe to say that the majority of the nation really has no clue uh, what a lot of these terms mean. And I think this data really illustrates um, that it really knows uh, no boundaries in regards to socioeconomics. Next slide. So what role can you play? And um, we've got a great panel of co-presenters who are going to offer a lot of different ideas and activities that you can play, but I think thinking more basically, you know, as we enter this uh, new era of ensuring people understand their care and understand their plan is building that culture of health literacy, you know, organization-wide training and awareness, just to keep it on folks' radar. So that way, you know, if an individual has a question about something, uh, there's a sense of unity in the organization where they can say, oh, you need to talk to so-and-so about this or that. Uh, utilizing your enrollment workers, which we'll talk about today, you know, providing education to those uh, staff and training them on health and health insurance literacy issues. You can incorporate it into your outreach program. Um, a lot of community health centers host health and wellness events. You could have a booth that talks about health literacy, health insurance literacy, creating customized resources, which we'll have an example of later, and utilize relationships for education. So, you know, tap into your community uh, leaders or community organizations that work a lot with the population that you've enrolled and that you're trying to get engaged to utilize their benefits. And also utilizing community health workers or promotoras on implementing health 
literacy and insurance literacy education training into their curriculum. Next slide. So now that we've talked a little more broad about why it's important, um, why we should, what you can do, I want to kind of break it down into some hard examples um, that we found in our region on, on how they decided to tackle, you know, educating people on how to use their benefits. And the first one comes from HealthPoint, and this is specifically by Global to Local, which was the organization I mentioned that they uh, partnered with. And their strategy was educating the staff. So educating the staff that was going to be working with these populations or are working with these groups. And as you can see on their client intake and assessment process, you'll see that they're assessing the client's knowledge, they're assessing the client's needs, so you're you know, finding out what they do know, what they don't know, really developing a structured next steps, and linking them to the proper resources or organizations where they can find further information. So they incorporated health insurance literacy um, into their IPA training. IPA stands for in-person assisters, for those that um, aren't familiar with that acronym. They provided um, an understanding of, of general health insurance terms, um, QHPs, qual uh, qualified health plans, Medicaid, and as well as a uh, basic understanding of, of general insurance terms and health terms. They created customized resources and learning tools for their staff, and again, built relationships in their community where they could connect consumers to resources or organizations for further assistance. So this promising strategy really focuses on educating the staff that uh, you're going to be utilizing to engage this population. The next strategy is educating the consumers. So you can't have one without the other. And I thought this was really great. This came from Central uh, City Concern, again, in Portland, Oregon. And they did a really fabulous job on creating this what's next, next step, right? Because again, folks think that coverage is the end of the line, but it's really not. And if you see, they really did this almost in um, linear order where, OK, you're, you can expect to receive the details of your coverage and card within X amount of days. And then if you have not received it, here's who you need to call. Here are the hours within uh, the day that have the shortest uh, wait time. So again, providing very specific instructions. And I'm sorry that the certain aspects of this image are um, bolted out. It is uh, specific names and contact information, and I, I want to be respectful of that. Um, third, they linked the individual up with a clinic and you know, let them know where to find them and who can help them, um, and that you can come to the clinic in person or make your appointment ahead of time. And since oral health, as previously mentioned by uh, the previous presenter, is a big issue, they, they noted that, you know, hey, if you're, if you're looking for a dentist and if you're looking for oral health care, this is where you can find it. And again, providing people with specific instructions on where to find it, who to talk to, here's the number, and how to get connected. And again, sort of a, a, a plug-in for primary and preventive care. Now that you have insurance, you can make an appointment for a checkup or a first appointment with your new doctor, even if you're not sick. And I love that emphasis, even if you're not sick, because again, it's planting that seed that you can utilize your care before you get sick or before you have an emergency. And again, just kind of noting the Oregon Health Plan component. So I thought this was really great, because I like how they customize it for their specific community providing next steps, what to expect, who to talk to, and letting, I think it also lets the consumer know that they care. And you know, people um, are much more receptive when you give them the information and let them feel empowered to tackle you know, their care on their own. Next slide. I also kind of wanted to touch base a little bit on other methods for addressing health and health insurance literacy. And one of my presenters will be doing a deep dive into this. But I think sort of the, the five kind of basic uh, rules on addressing this issue is building, again, that safe and shame-free culture. You know, a lot of folks might be embarrassed um, to say that they can't read or that they, they don't understand what the physician or nurse is saying. So again, you know, building that culture uh, of, of safety and awareness is really critical. You'll hear um, by the next presenter about the Teach Back method, which is a great method on um, helping consumers understand almost anything. and. Uh, utilizing engaging questions and, again, creating that safe culture for folks uh, to feel that they can ask questions or that they can say, you know, I don't understand. Uh, utilizing the use of imagery and pictures, which is really great for folks where English is their second language or they might have general low literacy rates. And again, emphasis on plain language. You know, a lot of folks don't know what laceration means, but they know 
what a cut is. And so again, being mindful that, you know, though we may speak in clinical terms and healthcare terms, that the majority of the population does not. And again, engaging the individual and in asking questions. Do you understand this? Do you have any other questions? Is there anything I missed to really make the individual feel safe um, that they can ask questions and share where they might need help? So that's it for me. And for those of you that might have any questions about general health literacy uh, training or other methodologies to address health or health insurance literacy, uh, my contact information is here. And I can, I'm happy to take questions uh, during the Q&A portion of this webinar. Thank you. Jessica, thank you so much. Um, this is Donna again. I think that you gave us some really good overview um, in the beginning, and I think some of the stuff that you talked about towards the end, particularly the importance of customizing materials so that they resonate in your own community, because every community is different. I think that was incredibly important. I hope that's one big takeaway that our uh, participants leave with. So thank you about that. Now. Um, we are really trying to be mindful of people's time. So if we uh, can hold questions until the end, um, we have been getting a few questions through the chat that Riley has been quickly um, responding to. One of the most uh, frequently asked questions is, will we see the slides? And yes, you will. As she said earlier at the top of the call, um, we'll be posting them in a couple of weeks um, on our Insure Kids Now website. Um, but please. Um, Jessica and Jane, do stick with us. We will have Q&A at the end, um, but we want to really uh, move on. And Jessica, you made such a wonderful, easy segue into our next presentation that I really think it's important for us not to lose momentum and introduce Lisa Stein, who is the Vice President uh, for Work and Family Supports for SeedCo. Um, SeedCo has been one of, uh, one of our Connecting Kids to Coverage grantees and has been doing lots of great work. Uh, for a long time. And Lisa, we welcome you this afternoon, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope, I hope folks um, are having a good afternoon. Thank you again for tuning in. Quickly about CECO, we are a national nonprofit, um, and our mission is to advance economic opportunity for people, businesses, and communities in need. We are based in New York. That's where I'm speaking to you from today. But we also have offices in Georgia, Maryland, and Tennessee. Um, and uh, the Work and Family Support portfolio that I manage is our Benefits Outreach Education and Enrollment Assistance portfolio. And I think most of our experience in learning and incorporating health insurance literacy has really come from our most recent navigator work in all four states. But prior to that, we, we um, did have CHIP contracts, we did have SNAP contracts, and in New York there was a facilitated enrollment program for Medicaid prior to the marketplace opening. And um, the statistic on the bottom of the screen kind of talks, and we, we work very hard to document the dollar impact we have on the folks we serve. So PCP, network, recertification, oh my, it gets really overwhelming really fast. And, 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 and it's a key barrier to understanding and using the coverage. So, um, so at the heart of it, like we talked about, is health insurance literacy. And we really define that as the ability to find and evaluate information about health plans, the ability to select the best plan for one's own or for the family's financial and health circumstances, and knowledge about using insurance once um, enrolled in order to obtain care. So that plays out that, you know, you understand the services that are covered in, by Medicaid or CHIP, that you understand your explanation of benefits and your subscriber contract. Um, you know what a PCP is and how to select one. And, and you know your rights as a covered individual. And I think our first speaker today spoke a lot to that, and it's really important. So health insurance literacy. When we began to do our navigator work, two of the states we operate in were state-based exchanges that did expand Medicaid, and two were federal-based exchange states that did not. Um, but we felt it was important in all four states to really incorporate um, interactive health insurance literacy training into the 
and provide additional training to all of our navigators. So we practice with health literacy experts. We practice translating a term like a household, co-payment, provider network, and breaking it down into easy to understand phrases. Um, we developed a health insurance liter literacy visual handbook for navigators to utilize while explaining difficult concepts. And I'll show you some snippets from that next. Um, after the first open enrollment period, because we had the four states, we sort of had our own lab, and we did an independent evaluation with the University of Georgia. And some of the key findings really reinforced the importance of incorporating this training and, and the principles into our materials, into our presentation skills. Um, if anyone is interested, the full report is available on our website, seco.org backslash UJA Navigator Report. So on this slide, you see two examples. So we developed this tool for, nav for navigators and assisters to use when discussing Medicaid enrollment if applicable, CHIP enrollment if applicable, and QHP enrollment when applicable. And the image on the left is, described, is a visual description of the difference between a household and an individual applicant. And the second graphic on the right is describing different types of networks. And what's really great about this book is that we did translate it into Spanish. And then we also did a version with, and so on the back of each page is an explanation from the navigator and, and when to use the, the, the picture descriptions. We also kept a, a version blank. We have groups that have translated it into Vietnamese. We have groups that have translated it into Chinese. Um, we have um, a navigator that has translated it into Russian. So it becomes an instant tool that can then be further adapted to the consumer and where their language and literacy needs are. And obviously, visual depictions are particularly helpful if someone is generally low literacy. So health insurance is confusing. Um, like my previous colleague talked about, so how do we help overcome those barriers? So first there was the visual, then they're sort of using everyday language, or we call it living room language. So whenever possible, we try to, the, try to avoid using acronyms. Um, if you have to use them, explain what they are. Um, whenever we are adapting materials that have been produced by other organizations or creating our own, we always try to make sure that we've used the most simple and clear language we can, visuals when we can, speaking clearly and articulating. We practice that um, in our training, in our supplemental training. Um, the idea of repeating terms and concepts in different ways, like sometimes you say it once, and then you need to kind of just twist it a little bit and try it again, or break it down into smaller chunks. Um, sometimes reading it out loud versus giving something someone something to read. It, it, it will depend on the consumer's ability to comprehend their literacy level. Sometimes hearing it feels less overwhelming than seeing four pages of small print, no space, little margin, etc. Um, referring to daily life and using analogies. So these are some examples that our navigators came up with that they were sort of there. Go to, here's how I explain it. So for co-payment, um, one navigator says, like paying cover charge to enter a club. Once you pay the copay, your health service or doctor's appointment can start. Um, an example for partial payment. It's like when you buy a coat on laid away. You can pay part of the price, the store holds the coat. You can pay the rest when you pick up the coat. Um, some terminology for describing network. It's like when you're paying for a cable plan. You have access to certain channels. You'll have to pay more the ones that are not in your cable plan. And, and those are some examples of ways that people tried to have it relate and feel real to the consumer they were sitting down and talking with. Um, it's so a lot confusing and so elaborate. So creating some context. Um, so you know, consumers have to have access to a provider, uh, to a provider directory. So describing that, you know, you're going to have this list. And it's going to describe all of the doctors and nurses and medical staff. You'll choose the person who will give you the services. Sometimes that's on a website. Sometimes that's in printed materials. 
And what we don't talk about here is I think another important piece in sort of post-enrollment work is the advocacy, and particularly in rural areas or communities where you're on um, bordering between states, we've had a lot of issues about what materials or websites have said was available in network versus what has been available in network, and often that takes a little bit of investigation. The teach back method, my, my previous colleague on her slideshow highlighted that. So some, some tools that our, our folks are using is asking a consumer to repeat in their own words what they need to do when they leave the appointment. So you're sort of confirming that they understood and they heard you. Um, also, it allows you to assess how well you explain the concept. Sometimes if you're at some larger enrollment event or you've been booked back to back, you're just trying to kind of get through your day, and it's a good self-check um, to just say, okay, did, I, did this person really understand me today? Um, some strategies for post-enrollment follow-up. Um, at CECO in all four of our states, we're maintaining consumer database and Salesforce to sort of capture assistance efforts and follow-up. It helps us become smarter and more effective each year in what we're doing and what's working better. Um, so to the extent that you are able to do that um, in terms of an organization and being a learning organization. In regards to working one-to-one -one with consumers, explaining the next steps for them to take after enrollment, Ex you know, explaining the concepts of recertification, of having to notify Medicaid of a household or income change. Um, also, making sure consumers understand whatever program requirement they have to report changes during the year, the time frame that they have, ways that they can do that. Keep in touch with them, reminding of these things with email blasts, postcards, text messaging. Some examples on my next slide include, um, so this was a sample um, of a flyer that we sent out um, in OE2. Um, we kept a lot of white space. We used a graphic tune-up, a checkup, that you know, um, would, would click with people and get the idea across. Some simple bullets that people could have buy into um, and, and, and really getting people to think about not, not having some control in that recertification process. Next slide. So this is an example of what someone who's working with a consumer might give to them after the session to help reinforce and remind them about these things. You know, here, here's what we, you have to do. You know, maybe you already have a doctor, you need to make an appointment. Um, maybe you haven't chosen your doctor yet. Maybe in your appointment with the person, you help them find a couple, but there were some other questions, and so they need to go back and do it themselves. You're reminding them what they've signed up for, maybe in a household, parents might have had the qualified health plan, and the children might be on Child Health Plus, and, you know, obviously giving the, the person who's assisting them the information that they can continue to work with that person you're developing this relationship. This helps reinforce some of that behavior. Um, then, you know, again, notifying consumers of the ways to report their changes and manage their account. Again, I think it's really important to be assisting consumers when there are complicated issues, when there's a need for some sort of an appeal, or there's some application-related issues. Whenever possible, some, some of you on the phone may yourself be a post-enrollment or a CAP program. Um, you may know, know an organization that does do provide that advocacy and post-enrollment assistance. You may be incorporating it. At CECO, we have a combination in different locations of either referring out for it or providing it ourselves. That's an important resource um, to, to the extent that your capacity in doing enrollment and, and post-enrollment work. Lisa, I think that, yep, thank you, everybody. <laughs> OK, hang on, Lisa. Um, first, okay. I just want to thank you. That was a great presentation, also digging into some of the uh, details for local communities. So we're grateful for that. Um, again, poll questions to the end. We now um, uh, are going to hear from Kara James, who is the director of the Office on Minority Health at CMS. Kara and I are colleagues of CMS. 
she's been working very hard on uh, articulating a lot of these concepts for organizations around the country, producing some uh, really fabulous materials, which I know she's going to share with you. And um, again, after Kara presents, we'll be taking questions for any of the presenters, and we do have a few in the queue already. Um, so Kara, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm uh, passing the baton to you. Thank you, Donna, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. I'm really excited to share with you a couple of resources that Donna mentioned we've been working on, um, and hopefully that can help you in the work that you're doing, working with consumers both to improve, as Jessica mentioned, their health as well as health insurance literacy. So a couple of years ago, uh, we started working on this initiative from Coverage to Care. And as Donna mentioned, 11.2 million additional individuals have enrolled in Medicaid and CHIP. And many of these individuals, this is the first time or the first time in a long time that they've had coverage. And they may not be familiar with a lot of the terminology or even how to use it to get the primary care and preventive services that they need. So we started uh, an effort to develop these resources. We talked to a number of stakeholders and consumers who were both insured and uninsured to find out what some of its barriers were going to be to help bridge that gap. We have a number of resources that are online and available in print, um, and I'm going to go primarily through our, our main document, which is our roadmap. But we also have a discussion guide for those of you who may be helping consumers to talk about a lot of these terms and to become familiar. And because we know people learn in different ways, we have some videos and other tools. This is an ongoing initiative, so as we have more individuals who are gaining coverage and helping them, we will be here to help them bridge that gap from coverage to care. And lastly, we know that building on um, coverage to care builds on a lot of existing networks and community partners because we know that those are the trusted sources in the community and the ways in that they have of communicating with consumers in a language that they understand and in a manner to help make it relatable as Lisa was showing in some of her materials in her previous presentation. So all of our resources are available on marketplace.cms.gov forward slash C2C. Um, as we note here, we have the roadmap. You can also order print copies um, through our CMS Clearinghouse. They are available for free. And you can see on the website um, all of the resources that we have uh, available and, as we noted, are working on additional resources. And you can sign up there to find out um, when those additional resources will be becoming available. So we encourage you, as you're talking to consumers, to take the roadmap and to use both the roadmap and the discussion guide to start a conversation with them about their coverage to help them um, and to talk about the importance of getting the preventive services that are right for them. When we started our work, again, as I mentioned, we talked to a number of consumers, and for many of them, they understood the importance of having coverage when they were sick, but didn't really think about it as a tool that could be used to help them stay healthy. So I'll talk to you a little bit about some of what we've done to try and address that, but we really do want to emphasize building those strong connections with primary care and preventive services so that they can live long and healthy lives. You'll go through the roadmap and you'll see that there is a lot of information in there. Um, and we don't expect that consumers will read through the information and get everything on the first go round. But we really hope that they will use this as a resource that they can refer back to as they journey to better health and well-being. And that you too can help be there for them to answer some of those questions they may have along their way and on their journey. We also encourage you to personalize it. We have space in the roadmap, and there's a customizable one on the Marketplace website where you can add information about your organization as well as information about local resources that are available uh, for consumers to get them the information that they need. So as you can see, this is the eight steps roadmap. This document is available as a poster. Um, and as a one-pager that you can share to just distill down the information, and it talks through the eight steps. And as you see on that first step, it's putting your health first. And we talk there about some of the preventive services. 
The next step is to understand your coverage, going through some of the terminology that you've heard uh, referred to in other presentations today, and the importance of knowing the difference between in-network and out-of-network care. In step three, we emphasize knowing where to go for care, really encouraging consumers to find a primary care provider rather than utilizing the emergency department for non-life-threatening illnesses and injuries. And in step four, we talk about finding a provider and provide some tips on how they can go about doing that. Again, understanding many consumers may not have had a regular provider before having coverage. And we help them in step five and six to make that appointment and be prepared for the visit. In step seven, because again, we are trying to encourage consumers to develop long-term relationships with their primary care provider to work on their health and wellness goals. We encourage them to decide if they like the provider and if the provider is right for them. We have a series of questions that we encourage consumers to go through to think about and reflect upon the experience that they've had. And as we were testing these materials out uh, last year when benefits became available or, um, in early January, we found that for a lot of consumers, they really found this step empowering. And for many of them, they didn't know that they had a choice or that it was okay to change their provider. And finally, we talk about those next steps after the appointment in terms of follow-up. So before we begin the roadmap, though, as Lisa was just mentioning, there's a lot that we encourage consumers to do before they even begin to use their coverage. So again, confirming if they have questions about their eligibility determination, we encourage them to contact their state's Medicaid and CHIP program. We also encourage them to learn about their benefits and pay your premiums if you have them. We note that some CHIP plans have premiums associated with them. And it, for some consumers, they think that they pay the premium one time and that's it. So helping to educate them about the importance of maintaining and paying their premiums consistently to maintain coverage. We also encourage them to find a provider and start to talk to them about what they can do to stay healthy. And as Lisa noted earlier, to keep their information current as changes in address and family size as well as household income can affect eligibility. So in step one, we encourage consumers to put their health first, emphasizing that staying healthy is important to them and the whole family, maintaining a healthy lifestyle at home and work in the community, and to get the recommended health screenings and manage chronic conditions. Um, Jane did a, a wonderful job going through the benefits that are available through the early periodic and diagnostic screening testing program with EPSDT. And so we emphasize those, but help consumers as well to think about healthy habits that they have, as there is a lot that they can do outside of the healthcare system. In step two, we encourage consumers to review the information they were provided when enrolled to see what services are covered and to become familiar with their costs. Throughout the roadmap, you'll note that we have little cost tips to help consumers to see some of the financial implications of the choices that they make. This was in response to a lot of the feedback we received during the pilot to help consumers become more familiar with those, those costs associated with their care. In this step, we also encourage consumers to know the difference between in-network and out-of-network care, as well as how to find a provider and to help them think about whether or not they can estimate how much they'll pay if they see a provider. In this step, you'll note one of our consumer tools, which is an example of an insurance card, to help consumers become familiar with where they can locate particular pieces of information and what that means when they call to make an appointment or if they call their Medicaid or CHIP program or uh, the insurance company to find out questions and get answers. In step three, we emphasize again knowing where to go for care, really trying to encourage consumers to use a primary care provider if it's a non-life-threatening illness or injury. Again, in the feedback of noting the importance of the cost associated with their choices, um, the first line really talks about some of the co-payments that consumers may have if they are utilizing uh, their primary care as compared to the emergency department. We also talk about the fact that with a primary care provider, you can generally call ahead and make an appointment and be seen around the time of that appointment, as opposed to the emergency department, where you can wait for several hours before you're seen if it's not an emergency. 
We also reflect on the fact that a primary care provider will often check other areas of their health and not just focus on the particular issue that brought them in that day as compared to the emergency department where they really do just focus on the importance of the, uh, the particular issue that brought them in. In step eight, we talk about those next steps after their visit, encouraging consumers to write down their provider's instructions and healthy living tips so they can act on them once they leave, as well as encouraging them to schedule any follow-up visits that they have or fill any prescription um, for services that they, they have, and to review documents that they have received if they have questions and to contact their plan or their state Medicaid and CHIP program if they have any questions. We also you know, encourage consumers to think about, do you know what to do to keep yourself healthy? Or do you know what number to call if you get sick and need to make a same day appointment or come back? The roadmap, as you see, will also have a number of other resources. We have a, a broader glossary of health coverage terms towards the end, more so than what we cover in uh, step two of understand your coverage. We also include a resource list that has additional resources such as questions to ask their provider and some uh, medication tracking management, as well as a personal health tracking checklist where consumers can write down information about some of their screenings that they have received. And finally, there's some information for them to write down more information about their, cover, their coverage and their provider contact information. So since we have released these resources nationally, we did so last June, we've seen a variety of organizations who are using these. And as you can see, they range not just from health organizations, but libraries to other insurance and issuers, faith-based organizations, as well as other social organizations. And I think part of that speaks to the fact that we really are trying to reach people wherever they are. Um, through whatever means to help them and the breadth of questions that we have um, for people who are helping them to understand their coverage as they go forward. Um, you also note that some of the uh, SHIP counselors, the state health insurance plan, these are or organizations working with our older Americans and they too have questions as they're aging into Medicare and understanding their coverage. So I think that one of the things you'll see is the resources, we really have tried to make them pretty general and applicable to anyone, regardless of the type of coverage that they have received, but we understand that there are unique aspects of everyone's coverage. So as I mentioned, Coverage to Care is an ongoing initiative. We're looking and continuing to expand our partnerships. We also are working on understanding and supporting um, the access to behavioral health services and thinking about ways in which we can help to clarify some of the questions and concerns that consumers have about their behavioral health coverage, knowing that many of them do not understand those uh, benefits in the system to be able to get the care that they need as well. We also have been um, interviewing and talking to newly insured uh, consumers, some of whom receive coverage through Medicaid, as well as through the marketplace or through an employer, to find out um, how our materials are working and some of the challenges that they're having as they move forward. And we are continuing to work on other resources as well to address some of the challenges and ultimately to figure out does this work. So what can you do? We encourage you to share the coverage to care resources to again customize them to your community and your local uh, resources that are available to consider incorporating the roadmap into local events and to outreach. I think this was a suggestion from one of our other presenters earlier in terms of incorporating some of this material, types of material into the work, as well as working with your state Medicaid and CHIP offices to tailor some of the resources to your specific program. Uh, we know that consumers want more information about their specific plans, um, and that would be a very good thing to add to that. And also, we don't want this to be one-sided, so how can we engage with providers and issuers on the other side to help them understand the needs and some of the challenges that these consumers may be facing as they come into Medicaid and CHIP for the first time and are using coverage to help them make the most of it and to have better provider-patient relationships. Finally, we'd love for you to let us know what works and what other resources would be useful 
in the work that you're doing and to help consumers as they journey from coverage to care and to help them understand their coverage and benefits available so that they can live a long and healthy life. So as we think about where we are um, and where we're going, the journey of 1,000 miles begins with a single step. 11.2 million additional individuals enrolled in Medicaid and CHIP is a huge step, and the next step is to really make sure that they are able to understand their coverage and connect to the healthcare system to get the care that they need. And I know that together we can ensure that all Americans have access to quality affordable health coverage and that disparities in health care are eliminated. Thank you so much. Um, you have really helped us uh, in proceeding on this journey. Everyone has, and we're very grateful for it. Um, we do have some time left for a couple questions. We've been getting good questions through the chat, so please use that um, avenue if you have more questions. I am going to give Riley uh, one minute to tell you about a, an upcoming activity, and then I'm going to get to the questions. Uh, we have at least one for all of our presenters, so hang on with us. And Riley, tell us about the Twitter Yeah, story. thanks, Donna. We just didn't want to let y'all go without telling you about our upcoming Connecting Kids to Coverage Twitter Storm. If you're not familiar, a Twitter Storm is just a kind of burst of activity um, on Twitter around a certain hashtag. So on May 5th, starting at 3 p.m., our, our Twitter handle, at IKNGov, um, will be tweeting along with co-hosts, American Academy of Pediatrics and Moms Rising using the Enroll365 hashtag to remind families that enrollment in Medicaid and CHIP goes year-round and to spread a lot of our campaign resources. So we hope you'll follow us, that's at IKNGov, and join us in our Twitter storm using the Enroll365 hashtag on May 5th at 3 p.m. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Donna so we can get to some of your great questions that you've answered. Great. Thanks, Riley. So I'm going to ask you the first question. Yes. Given all the new information that came out in today's webinar, can we add some tweets or encourage people to tweet about some of the things that uh, we talked about specifically this afternoon? Absolutely. We're going to encourage people really to get creative with what they share via Twitter, and as long as you're using that Enroll365 hashtag, you can um, kind of chime in with your two cents about what you're working on, different resources that may relate to health insurance literacy, etc. So we encourage people to write that kind of information. Terrific. Um, now, let's get to your questions in the time that we have left. Um, and I will say some of the questions, um, Riley has been getting back to people individually, so um, there's been a lot of activity. Um, Jane, I hope you're still with us. From the very beginning of the web, uh, webinar, you, you launched us in a great direction. In your presentation, you gave some really great information about health disparities and some of the issues that low-income children face to a larger extent than children more generally. And one of our uh, uh, participants has asked if you could provide a list of citations of sources for that information. I think others want to use some of that information and want to know where it comes from. So um, are you able to share that with us? And we can share that with everybody else. I would be happy to do that. And if I could just uh, hijack the list a little bit, I, I just took three examples. I can provide some additional examples with a, a fuller list because different people walk in the different the door with different conditions. So I will make a list uh, with the disparities and the source citation to them. Fabulous. That will be tremendously helpful. I know as groups are preparing talking points for the media, as they're thinking about how they want to focus some of their uh, materials, these kinds of, uh, this kind of information is super important. So thanks, Jane. If you get it to Riley, we will get it out to our participants. Um, I'll do that. Terrific. Thank you. So we had several questions about oral health care. And we were chuckling a little bit here in the, uh, the control room because one of the things that we uh, said as we were beginning this webinar is that the only, um, that, that this webinar had more people subscribe to it even than our Think Teeth webinar. We have so many people interested in oral health that that was one that we really got a lot of participation. But this one today beats it, but it's fitting that we got some oral health questions. A couple of things. 
One, um, we got a question about um, uh, helping pregnant women understand the need for oral health care and um, solidifying uh, and nurturing relationships with, with oral health care professionals. What I wanted to mention was that on insurekidsnow.gov, we have um, an oral health page that has a whole host of materials that are focused on uh, consumers uh, needing uh, information about oral health care and also about the benefits that Medicaid and CHIP provide. And one is specifically related to pregnant women and uh, mothers with very young children. There's a lot of information out there um, that I think uh, we would characterize as myth busters. Um, in fact, pregnant women should go to the dentist. There's, you know, I think some uh, confusion about that. We tried to um, we tried to set the record straight on that. We have a brand new piece that uh, looks at uh, it's for parents of children with special health care needs, special things that they might want to be thinking about as they look for a dentist that can help their child because many times children with special health care needs have special needs when it comes to oral care. So you'll find all of those materials on insurekidsnow.gov. And I will say, too, we have a growing outreach video library, and we are in the process of producing a new video that's all about uh, dental care and what uh, uh, the importance of dental care and the fact that Medicaid and CHIP do cover uh, dental benefits for children and, and, how to, um, and how that link is helping so many children. So look for that. Uh, very soon on our uh, outreach video library, which you can also find on the website. Um, uh, I think uh, we have a question, uh, Kara, for you. Um, uh, the question was whether or not there is any kind of funding stream for uh, helping people with printing and dissemination of the connecting uh, uh, the coverage to care uh, materials. Um, I know that uh, uh, you talked about where people can get them, but is there some help available with respect to uh, producing them or getting them in quantity? So thank you for that question. So right now, as we mentioned, you can order the materials for free uh, from the warehouse. You can get them in large quantities. We also are offering, if anyone would like to have the commercial uh, version of it to print on their own, that they can, they can do that. Um, we don't have at this particular point a, like a grant program or something to help with the dissemination. Uh, we have been largely relying on a lot of those existing networks and um, many of the organizations are themselves sort of navigator and assister organizations already. I also forgot to mention, um, and people will see it on the website, that we have translated the materials into seven languages. Um, and those are the roadmap is available in, in Spanish, as well as Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Russian, Arabic, and Haitian Creole. Um, and those were our, our sort of top languages for the call center and some of the resources that we had available during open enrollment. Great. Thank you so much, Kara. Uh, there's one more related question. I think so many of our participants who are on our uh, kind of our, on our ongoing webinar series know that we are able to uh, customize our materials for uh, connecting kids to coverage, uh, you know, having people uh, tell us that they want their own logo on it, their own phone number, and of course we're able to do that. We have some constraints with um, uh, helping with printing, but we can do the design work, and I'm wondering if that is the case for the C2C materials as well. Mm -hmm. That's another great question, and so yes, there is on uh, the marketplace.cms.gov forward slash C2C. There is a, a link at the first where you'll see the roadmap. There is a customizable PDF that also includes a little documentation on where exactly the roadmap can be customizable to add uh, your information um, and, and logo. So that is something that is available. Terrific. Thank you for sharing that because I know that that's, you know, as we talk about the importance of making sure the materials speak to your own community, having a familiar logo, local phone number, that sort of thing is super helpful. So thank you for sharing that, Kara. Um, I want to go back to Lisa. 
Um, we had a question early on as you were describing the health literacy tool from Steveco. You talked about a website that people can check in with to uh, get those materials. If you could repeat that for folks, that would be great, and then we'll send it out to everyone as well. Um, so that's a bit of, of confusion. The, the, Riley did put in the chat box the, the report that we did on health literacy and that that was available, both a summary or a full version. The literacy handbook is not a, like on a website where you can download it yourself. Um, um, I'm happy to um, think about working with you how I could make, you know, on a request to, to get PDF that I don't really have it in a, in a downloadable place at the moment. But okay. I'm, I'm willing to figure out how to make that work. Okay, thanks for that, Lisa. And um, we'll, we'll circle back with you and see what we can do to help. Uh, but you should know that people thought it was uh, the type of material that they would like to have. And so um, we'll, we'll see what we can do to, to help in that regard. Um, there was one other dental uh, health issue that I wanted to mention, and many of you uh, may have uh, already seen this on the Insure Kids Now website. We do have a tool on the Insure Kids Now website um, that families can use to find uh, dental health providers that accept Medicaid and CHIP. And uh, it's right. Uh, it's right on the on the home page. On the home page. If you scroll down to the bottom, so I'm about to send out a link. Right, and um, I think you put in your zip code. You may put put in some other information that is uh, uh, important for finding the right provider. And um, uh, those uh, providers are sent back to you uh, within a certain mile radius that you. Uh, that you designate. So that's a tool that we've uh, been providing for a while. We're trying to keep it, we're working with states to keep it up to date. Many people have asked us if we have a similar tool for other kinds of providers. At present, we, we don't, but we do know that that is a particularly helpful uh, piece. So I want to just, uh, we're one minute over, but since this is such an important question, I'm wondering if any of uh, our, our speakers um, have any thoughts for folks on the best way of identifying uh, providers in the community that do accept, uh, that are accepting new Medicaid patients? Um, Jane or uh, Jessica, do you have any thoughts on that? It is a really challenging uh, uh, thing sometimes, uh, but we know that uh, you know, state agencies can help, but how can community organizations help? This is Jane. Um, we have worked with some community-based organizations in the past that have done some uh, cold calling uh, to just uh, particularly where managed care organizations are in place and have listed in their directories the dentists who are participating. They'll just periodically call dentists in the listing to make sure that they're still accepting new patients or to confirm that they indeed are not. Um, so that is one suggestion. Um, some managed care organizations will post their directories online. And um, again, we've worked with community groups that have sort of monitored those to make sure they're up to date and to, to, to keep them at help pressure on to keep, to keep them accurate. Great. Thank you so much, Jane. Jessica, did you have anything to add to that? I wonder from the Community Health Center point of view, is there something that you would like to share? You know, I think it really varies from state to state, but uh, some of the suggestions that Jane mentioned would be a good starting point. Uh, there are some organizations, again, it's kind of state by state that keep those lists. Um, but right off the top of my head, I'd have to do a little bit of digging uh, to find those names specifically. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, um, both uh, Jane and Jessica, for that. Um, the only thing I'll add is that, you know, again, this is a, uh, a vexing problem. Um, in a national survey that CMS did just a couple of years ago, we learned that for uh, children, uh, this was really an issue, particularly for specialists, 
but not so much parents report, not so much for um, you know, primary care providers, but um, it's still something to be very mindful of and to find ways of, uh, of helping people in your community. Um, I want to just, we're four minutes over, we try never to do that, but we've had such great participation and great questions. I want to take the opportunity to thank everyone. Uh, we had hundreds of people who stuck with us to the very end. I particularly want to thank all of our presenters, Jane Perkins from NHELP, Jessica Bucard from the Northwest Regional Primary Care Association, Lisa Stein from CEDCO, and Kara James from CMS. Um, I want to thank also our team here at Connecting Kids to Coverage who um, coordinated and cajoled and helped to um, pull all of this together and kept track of your good questions um, and helped with the really great uh, set of slides which will be available uh, very soon on Insure Kids Now. Um, now that we are at uh, five minutes past the uh, appointed time, I want to take the opportunity to just thank you all very, very much to let you know that if you are signed up or will sign up for our e-newsletter, we'll be sending you lots of information uh, about activities down the road, including our next webinar, which will talk about summer safety and getting into back to school time. So we're um, shocked, actually, that we're back at back to school time already, but we are. Um, we'll be uh, sending you materials about that through our e-newsletter, information about our e-newsletter. Do participate in the Twitter storm. Um, we're very excited about that. In May, we have some other activities that are getting started for our uh, spring wave. Again, our main message is you can apply for Medicaid and CHIP at any time, and if you're eligible, get enrolled to get those health benefits that everyone's been talking about today. Thank you very, very much.